Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> On Tuesday, we had um, a, a wonderful time at the Light Cafe. Thank you to all of those who helped. Hopefully, you've all had a letter from me anyway, thanking you for your help. But we had a, a wonderful time at the Light Cafe. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because, obviously, Wednesday, I thought the date's right, I mean, Wednesday was um, All Saints Day. Um, and we are All Saints Church. So actually today in the church also is All Saints Day if you didn't do it on Wednesday. So I thought it would be rather nice as we are All Saints Church just to, uh, to have some <clears throat> references to today being All Saints Day. So uh, let us pray. O Lord, be with your church and all her members who belong to you by baptism and faith. At the bidding of the Lamb, our Shepherd, give us ears to hear your word and faith to receive him in your blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now. So our opening hymn this morning, Angel Voices Ever Singing, number 34. Let's praise the Lord. So from our blue orders of service, the Lord be with you. <clears throat> Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you like to sit or kneel as we come to a time of confession? 
Let us open ourselves and our hearts before the Lord, that we can pray to him in the knowledge that he takes it all away. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God of glory, touch our lips with the fire of your spirit that we with all creation may rejoice to sing your praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Denise will bring our first reading. The reading is taken from Thessalonians 1, verse 2, 9 to 13. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship we work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as, as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. This is the word of the Lord.
The Gospel reading is taken from Matthew, chapter 24, verses 1 to 14. And that can, and that can be paid, um, found on page 1003. Signs of the end of the age. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all the nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but whoever stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Praise to you, O Christ. So let us pray. Dear God, as we um, study your word this morning, please speak to us. It's a hard passage. I just ask you to help us understand. Amen. Please be seated. I'm sure Robert, when he was picking who was going to preach today, I think he picked on his curate and thought, I know I'll get her to preach on this one. <laughs> So the Gospel reading which we've just heard seems very relevant today as the news from around the world is full of violence and wars with nations rising up against nations. And if it's not the trouble in the Middle East or Ukraine on our television screens, we see all of the destruction that earthquakes and other natural um, disasters have caused in recent months, including the UK itself just in the past weeks. The persecution of Christians is also something which seems to be covered in the national news more and more. And it's these three things, war, natural disasters, and the persecution of Christians that Jesus mentions when he's talking to these disciples about the signs of the end of age. But before we explore Jesus' words further, let us first take a look at what happened prior to this conversation which caused his disciples to ask such things in the first place. So Jesus and his disciples were leaving the temple after Jesus had condemned the scribes and Pharisees for their ungodly behaviour. And at the end of chapter 23, and after his great condemnation against them, Jesus still longs for their repentance and for them to turn back to him. And it ends in these words of lament from Jesus. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. So your house is left to you, desolate. For I will tell you, you will not see me, see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So when the disciples were leaving the temple in Jerusalem with Jesus, they would probably be mulling over his words in astonishment at his declaration that their house, the temple, would be left desolate. The temple itself at that time was a magnificent building 
and would have dominated the city and the skyline. And it was the centre of Judaism and the pride of all its people. So as they walked away from the temple and it came into their view in all its glory, they would have been so impressed by it, just as they were every time they looked at the temple. And they pointed it out to Jesus, while hoping that his earlier prophecy about it being left desolate would not really happen. So it must have been a real shock to them when he looked at the temple that they were pointing at and responded by saying, you see all of these, do you not? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another, all will be thrown down. And it seems that the disciples were so stunned by Jesus' words that they did not say anything until they had came to rest on the Mount of Olives overlooking the temple, which we see in Mark's Gospel. And it was at that point they started to privately question him and ask, tell us when will this will be and what will the sign of your coming and the end of the age? These are two very, very different questions. The first was referring to the fall of Jerusalem, which would end when the fall of Jerusalem would happen. And we know in 70 AD, about 40 years after Jesus spoke this, this did in fact happen. And the second Jesus was referring to when Christ, uh, the disciples were referring to when Christ would return and what the signal of the end of age would be. A time when this present age will come to an end and God's kingdom will come in all its fullness. So in other words, the end of this age which we are living now and the beginning of the age to come. And it's important that we recognise the two different questions here because Jesus' answers and um, answers to them both are intertwined and it's not always easy to know which question he is answering when. And we also need to bear in mind that the disciples asking these questions were Jewish men who were looking for the Messiah to come to fulfil the Old Testament prophecies and would have had um, certain expectations of the Messiah. They would have been familiar with passages such as Zechariah 14, who predicted a time of great tribulation before the arrival of the Messiah. A time when they may have considered that they were already living in, as the nation had experienced great tribulation under Antiochus M. IV, who had slaughtered thousands of Jews and desecrated the temple. They were at times living under the oppressive rule of Rome. And they also knew that the Messiah would come after an Elijah-like forerunner, which Jesus had already um, confirmed in John the Baptist. So the next event they would have been expecting was for the Messiah to appear and set up his kingdom. And it was just days earlier that they had witnessed Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And therefore, they would have been looking for the last commonly held beliefs about the coming of the Messiah to be fulfilled which they believe would be when the Messiah overcomes the alliance of nations that came, had come to fight him, resulting in the restoration of Jerusalem. The Jews who had um, um, once been scattered and will be back together again in Israel, and Jerusalem will become the center of the world with all nations under Israel's control. And the Messiah's kingdom will bring a new and eternal age of peace, righteousness, and divine glory. So it's in this context the disciples were asking when and how Jesus was going to establish his kingdom, as they believed it was going to be very soon because of all what was going on around them. A question which Jesus doesn't answer until much later on in the passage when he tells them that only the heavenly fathers knows when this will take place. Instead, he tackles their second question, what will be the signs of your coming and the end of age? And the answers which Jesus gives, I think, are very relevant for us today. First, Jesus tells them in verse 4, Beware that no one leads you astray, for many will come in, your, in my name saying, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. So throughout history, there's been many people who have stepped out claiming to be Christ or representatives of God, whose teachings draw people away from the truth of Christ. Many have claimed to know the time and date of Christ's return and how the world is going to end. 
I don't know about you, but in 1999, I remember um, many false teachers were predicting the end of the world um, as we entered the new millennium, and this caused a great panic across all of the world. So today, in a world that there are many different cults, religious groups, and ways of life that all draw us away, all draw people away from the truth of Christ, and unfortunately, it is not easy for individuals, including us, to not get caught up with it all and start being led astray without even realising it. And to prevent this from happening, we need to know God's word really well so that we can discern the truth from deception and falsehood. We need not only to be hearing God's word on a Sunday morning, but we need to be regularly reading and studying it to gain better understanding of what is being said so when people deceive us, and they will do, we will know the truth and not be led astray and away from Christ. So immediately after Jesus warns his disciples not to be deceived, he gives them another instruction, which was that they were not to be alarmed when they heard of wars and rumours of wars. He emphasised that these things must take place as well as famines and earthquakes in various places before the end comes. He compares them to being like birth pangs. So when you hear at the moment about all the wars that are going on in the Holy Land and other places, as, um, the very, and all the um, various natural disasters which have occurred in recent months, we are not to be alarmed at all of these things, as they need to happen before the great and glorious day when Christ returns. However, that does not mean we should be sitting around and watch it happen but instead we should actively be trying to bring peace and justice and freedom to the world so greatly in need. And it is for us to point people to the real Christ, the Christ of the Bible, the Christ that we follow, so the world is not deceived by false Christs. Jesus used the destruction of the temple as a symbol of the destruction of the hypocrisy of those systems and institutions that oppress people and exclude them. The end of the temple marked the beginning of these unjust systems and institutions that oppress and perpetrate unjust being overthrown. A time in which we are still living today. So rather than ourselves focusing on the question which the disciples asked regarding the, um, Jesus' return, maybe we should be asking instead, what can we as individuals and a church be doing to point people to Jesus and bring peace, justice and freedom to our troubled world? A question which will require all of us to examine our own lives and our church to see if there are things in which we are doing that perpetrate injustice or do not promote peace or stifle freedom before we then make the changes necessary to rectify that behaviour. Through these actions, God's character will be reflected through us and in our local communities and throughout the world. So Jesus goes on to share some more signs which will happen before his return which were the persecution of believers, as well as false prophets, again, which will lead people astray, and the love of many will grow cold. Throughout Christ um, history, Christians have been persecuted because of their faith, including most of the disciples who were martyred for their faith. However, over the last hundred years, more people have been persecuted than ever before. And in this passage, Jesus highlights that persecution in, um, endured will weed out all the false believers from the true believers before he focuses again on many being deceived by false prophets and false teachings. He then goes on to say that due to the increased lawlessness of, within society, the love of many will grow cold. They will love the world and the things in it more than Jesus, their saviour. So during this time, it will be tough to be a Christian as persecution will not only be physical, but emotional and mental too. And the false teaching will be so convincing that many will be led astray and away from God. But good news to all those who will, um, so good news for all those who endure to the end as they will be saved. 
and to be able to endure this persecution and deception goes back to my earlier point of the importance of knowing the scriptures so that we know the Jesus in which we follow and stand firm in what we believe when persecution and deception comes our way. And then through all of this, in our words and actions, the good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world, just as Jesus declares before the end comes. Amen. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask you today to, um, to speak to us through the scriptures. Just ask you that we all have a longing to want to know more about you and that we open our Bibles up and we study them more and more so that we can stand firm when persecution and deceit, um, deceit comes our way. Amen. Thank you, Kirsty. So let us follow that word and the words of the Nicene Creed where we can stand and profess our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you like to sit or kneel as Elaine leads us in our intercessions? Let us pray. Everlasting God, our creator and savior, you love us and know us better than we know ourselves. We pray to you on this Sunday morning and give you thanks for all that you have done for us. Your words tell us in Psalm 68, verse 19, Blessed be the Lord, who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. We thank you for blessing us each and every day with your love and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for your church throughout the world. We remember those Christians in countries where their beliefs make them vulnerable and in danger. Uphold and strengthen all who are persecuted and tortured for their faith. We pray for ourselves that we will be faithful when we are ridiculed or insulted for practicing our religion. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon this congregation and upon all the poor inland benefice churches. May your presence be seen vividly in what we and our brothers and sisters in Christ do each day. We thank you for our church leaders, Robert, Rachel and Kirsty, and all those who pray, 
preach and teach together with our church wardens and deputy wardens Barry, Graham and Caroline. We support them all with their ongoing commitment to our churches and community. May you bless, support and protect them and their families in all that they are called to do. May they be led by your Holy Spirit, keeping your call fresh in their hearts, renewing and refreshing their spirit for the work ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the way in which the Bible brings guidance, hope, health and healing to people everywhere. We pray for the work of those who support our community, for Gary, our youth worker, and for all those involved with the Norwich Youth for Christ project, for the Youth Cafe at Framingham Earl High School and other youth sessions in our community, for our home groups, Bible study groups, the gathering sessions organised by Rachel and Jill, and the Alpha courses. We ask for your blessings, Lord, on all those who work tirelessly to introduce the Bible to people's hearts and minds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for our local community. Please show us how we can best serve people who are struggling in any way. We pray for all children, students, teachers and staff at schools and colleges as they have returned to their roles in education this past week after their previous half-term holiday. May they all feel refreshed and energised with your Holy Spirit to face the challenges throughout this term. We give you thanks, Lord, for the many volunteers who help to support the Light Cafe in Pouring Land Village Hall on Wednesday. We thank you that so many teenagers, young children with parents, grandparents and friends were able to connect with the Church's Together volunteers. Thank you for filling the village hall with your warmth and love. And though we live in a world with danger and evil, we have you, God, that loves us and promises to protect us. We can trust that you, dear Lord, will care for us and keep us safe in your arms. Scripture tells us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. And this includes the protection of you, dear Lord. Therefore, we thank you, Lord, for your protection of our community during Halloween last week. We pray for this evening, as many will celebrate and have celebrated Bonfire Night. May our young people be educated on the dangers of fire and fireworks. Keep all those safe who attend bonfire displays or have fireworks in their own gardens. Shield and protect our fire and emergency services as you are the God that answers by fire. 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 24. A fire goes before you, O Lord, and burns up your enemies. Psalm 97 verse 3. Lord, release your fire and burn up the works of darkness this evening. Lord, in your mercy. Father God, we ask you to bless and care for King Charles and Queen Camilla as they serve our country. We pray for the UK government and other world leaders to address the climate change crisis. 
as our world experiences ever more extreme weather conditions each year. We pray for all those who have lost their homes, their livelihoods, following the devastating flooding and hurricane force winds impacted by Storm Kieron on Thursday. We pray for the many schools that were closed, homes and businesses that were left without power and severely damaged. Let us fix our eyes on you, Lord, who, who can do more than we can ask or imagine. And we pray for decisive action to be taken to put a halt to climate change in our world. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, we pray for all countries that are torn apart by conflict, illness and hunger. We pray for peace in the world, bringing before you the troubles and dangers of people and nations seriously affected by conflict and war especially Gaza, Israel and Ukraine. Our hearts break at the devastation and suffering that we see and we know it breaks yours too. We ask that you would stretch out your mighty hand to bring an end to these wars. We cry out for people who have been injured or traumatised, who have lost their loved ones lost their homes, lost their communities. Please provide everything that they need and be their comfort, their hope, their healer and their safe refuge. We pray for your peace to reign. We look, look to you as our saviour and the hope of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for victims of violence, abuse and neglect, especially where it occurs within the family circle. Be with them in their time of great need and pain and heal their physical and mental wounds that they may be restored to health with the strength to face the future. We pray for all who are sad or upset today the grieving, the lonely, the lost and the bereaved. We pray especially for those who feel silenced or oppressed. May you bring light into dark places, restore hope and vision to all who struggle and bring well-being and comfort to all those who suffer. We especially pray for those who will not recover and are now on their journey to you. We remember the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verses 39. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. In a few moments of quiet or aloud, bring before our Lord anyone you feel needs our prayers today. For Michael and Nancy. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, as we go out into the world, shining with your light and your truth, help us to reflect your love in our families, our church and our community, so that the world can witness that we are followers of Christ and through that witness draw others into your loving care. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
to all who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of God's peace.
Let's pray. Lord of heaven, in this Eucharist, you have brought us near to an innumerable company of angels and to the spirits of the saints made perfect, as in this food of our earthly pilgrimage, we have shared their fellowship. So may we come to share their joy in heaven through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise of glory. Amen. So some words of blessing before our final hymn. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, nor fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and into all eternity. Amen. Our final hymn is Love Divine, number 449.
So a final prayer for All Saints Day. Almighty Father, we give you thanks that you have washed us in the blood of the Lamb, written our names in the Book of Life, and made us a royal priesthood and heirs of an eternal inheritance. Though we are unworthy of your saving grace, we pray you to hear us in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom, with whom, and through whom all honour and glory is yours, Heavenly Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. So may we go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.